Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Low Code Cafe. This is episode number 150 for November 29th of 2023. 150 episodes in. Amazing to me. Anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, how to master filter forms and uh, put them into your low code toolbox. Uh, before we get to that, let me introduce myself. I am Dale Warner, head of support for Plant and App. Joined today on the panel, we have uh, Patrick Anderson, technical success manager for Plant and App. So between the two of us, we'll uh, talk about uh, filtering forms and uh, other things. The Low Code Cafe is an event we do um, every other Wednesday. It's bi-weekly, and uh, so we'll be doing it again two weeks from now. But this is an opportunity for us to uh, tell you about updates, do some demonstrations, do some hands-on low coding. Um, it's not only from us. You can be our guest speaker if you put together an app or a piece of an app that would be uh, of interest to our community. We'd love to host you. <coughs> We record all these, put them out on YouTube, so there's 149 hours of very good um, content for Low Code Cafe already out there. This one will be uh, joining that uh, later this week. We'll be doing uh, just two segments today, the From the Trenches of Support segment. I'll be talking about the updates that are available to you, and then we'll drive right on into hands-on low-code development. But do engage with us. There's a chat window. There's a Q&A function. You can raise your hand if you want to talk. But after it's all over, use our feedback form. You'll find the link to that uh, in uh, our chat and, as, and the emails that we send you as well. As I mentioned, we're going to uh, have the next uh, Low Code Cafe webinar on December 13th. And then we've tentatively scheduled an end of year special uh, for December 20th. So we'll talk more about our uh, schedule, I guess, next time. All right, let's dive right in. From the trenches of support, we have um, a number of hot fixes that have already been released. Our current version is version 1.25. We've released 64 hotfixes to various parts and pieces of the application, and uh, we're releasing eight more, uh, in, or we have already released eight more in these last two weeks. Uh, as a general thing, when you look for hotfixes, uh, watch for when there is a, a requirement, and you'll see this when you're viewing the hotfixes, and if you dig down into the information of the hotfix, it'll tell you that uh, certain hotfixes require something else. And so the main one that we have going on right now is that you have to get App Builder fully patched. Uh, I think the, it's 164 or higher in order for it to work. Uh, we changed a couple of things in that release, and um, so we, we need uh, some of our um, other things, other hotfixes that you can install, if you install them before getting this uh, higher version of App Builder, your implementation might break. Uh, as a best practice, doing a backup before you install hotfixes is always a, uh, recommended. For those of you who use our hosting, that's a one-click operation. Most of you already have backups set up. Just a reminder that uh, you'll want to do backups. So what did we fix? Well, well, the main, there is a bug fix that uh, we've implemented. If you're using version 125, you, uh, we, we added the ability uh, in our training module to start telling you about features that are uh, available to you. And uh, this, this feature was generating additional uh, pages and conditions uh, the net result of that is that in, in some places, because there were lots of uh, triggering uh, events that uh, really were not useful, that uh, was a performance slowdown. So if you have uh, version 125, we highly recommend, I think we've got this one marked as, as critical. It will uh, help you avoid a performance issue on your site. Uh, we've made three bug fixes to listings. Uh, so one of them is the uh, some security improvements uh, having to do with data sources, uh, but we also uh, fixed, there was an issue where uh, if you used the server request action doing a get, that the data parameters weren't being passed in. So there was a whole section there that 
uh, you, you have a ability to pass parameters to the server request whatever to the server that you're communicating with and use the data parameter section that wasn't working so that's fixed we had some alignment issues with uh, our new user interface so we're cleaning some of that stuff up um, the, some security uh, improvements relating to uh, the, the data source and the button permissions um, we have a new view that's in experimental state the hierarchy view and uh, we, we wanted to uh, Patrick, can you clarify? We we turn off. Uh, search is no longer available. Search is not available when the hierarchy view is enabled, um, but uh, you can have multiple views uh, enabled at one time. So what was fixed was that when you switch to another view where search is available, the search box appears. Thank you for jumping in on that one. Uh, and then in Form Builder, there was uh, a, a security issue that was fixed having to do if you use a large text field. Um, in APIs, we had a bug where if you were uh, if you were using an execute actions action, uh, and that that action allows you to put lots of actions, one or more actions inside of it. So if you disabled them, uh, they were not getting disabled appropriately. So that's fixed. And two enhancements. So um, in our file management, if you're outputting. Uh, when the output token for the HTML to Word action now supports all the different file tokens. So that's uh, an improvement. And uh, this one, this last one, we'll see it here as I demonstrate along. But you know, if you use our page builder theme, and this was a suggestion from our community, by the way, our campfire community, uh, the, the page builder gear icon uh, now is visually identifying what kind of a thing that you're about to edit. It also lets you, um, and this says it allows you to sort them. We didn't do the sorting part yet, um, but you'll be able to see what type they are. You'll also be able to open them in a new page from that icon. So uh, a couple of handy develop developer experience kinds of improvements. So those are our enhancements. We uh, get together on Fridays uh, for an event called Low Code Campfire. So we encourage you to uh, uh, participate, to join in. It's uh, this same hour uh, on Fridays, but it's an interactive format. So you get the chance to um, talk with us and among each other. And we uh, often see uh, issues brought up and solved. Um, and so we, we took off last Friday, but we'll be resuming Campfire this Friday. So come join us in two days. It's also an opportunity to talk uh, about um, the things that we cover in the Low Code Cafe. So it's a chance to go a little, little bit deeper or to uh, tease the host on things that he messed up during the presentation. So good time to be had by all. Uh, Patrick will probably put these links on. Yeah, he's ahead of me. The links for this episode are now on the chat. So you can get to things like registering for the Low Code Campfire get to all of our recordings, get to the community portal, which is a great place. We answer questions there, but also uh, your fellow community members will answer questions there on how to do certain things. So that's a great place to start. Um, and then our whip and our feedback form that I mentioned earlier. So tell us what you thought about this, unless, unless you want to needle me in person and then we can do that on Fridays. So with that, we will jump into hands-on low coding. Today, we're going to talk all about filter forms and at least, um, yeah, get, get more than, than uh, scratch the surface on filtering forms, why you might use them <clears throat> and what they might look like, how you can implement them. So this is where we're going today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our goal, why filtering forms are might be a good idea for you. And then we're just going to build them from scratch. We'll start with a blank page. We'll build a listing. And we'll configure it so that it's ready to, uh, to work with the filtering form. Uh, then we'll go on and build the filtering form that will use the query string. Uh, so you can change the URL so that um, the, the uh, form filters. And uh, then we'll 
convert that over another way to do it. You can, instead of doing it by query string, you can do it by session variables. There are really any number of ways that you can do it, but we'll experiment with some different ways. So we'll do uh, session variables. And then um, it, uh, we'll talk about visually how it looks. You might want to implement it in a tab, which we'll demonstrate, or in a pop-up, which we'll demonstrate. So lots of different options that using these filtering forms. So yeah, first thing, the goal, why are we doing this? Um, sometimes a listing has many, many rows, and so it has perf uh, might, might come up slower than you want. So to improve performance, you might use a filtering form. This would allow you to uh, specify your filtering before your form loads. And so it's, instead of if you, if you know that you don't need all of the rows, you can start filtering it down to uh, the rows that you will need. And then that way the, the listing will be more um, performant. You might have some complex filtering needs that aren't addressed by the filtering that we provide built in. So that's another reason to do it. Um, and, and so if you can't express your filtering using the, the search and the filters that are built in, we can, the form will do that. There might be some convenience issues like being able to retain your filters uh, as presets or as user preferences so that uh, as they browse to the to the listing, it's showing the way that you want it. And then, as I mentioned, the there's presentation. We provide a default presentation where uh, the listing has search at the top and filtering at the top. You can click and um, quickly search, you get a lot of capability just by uh, using what we provide. But if you don't want it right at the top, or if you want it on a separate page or things like that, you can present it in a different way. And so for all of those reasons, uh, you can have a solution. Um, you have a form that filters a listing. Um, I it didn't, Patrick, I'm going to try and put you on the spot a little bit. I'm um, just going to ask the open question if you can think of other reasons or I've seen users um, do use filtering forms for reasons other than what I've already presented. Um, I don't think so. I, I think they, um, a, a common one that I've seen is, uh, is the um, is the high number of records and uh, you know, completely uh, um, keeping you know, keeping, making it so that there's no records when the, when it first loads and then it only responds to the filters. That's a. Uh... Good. So um, it sounds like we're on target. So let's dive in. The first step that we're going to do is to build a listing. The only preparation that I've done for this is to, I've made a, uh, I've actually had a, a uh, entity for a long time called app random. It has a lot of random data in it. And it's just for the, I built it just for this purpose to demonstrate that uh, help work with a large number of rows. Because when you, when you demonstrate and we have uh, 10 rows or 100 rows of data, uh, it's a it definitely, uh, you do, you're not encountering performance issues. So you're, you're just focusing on, on functionality of a listing, for example. But when the row number, uh, if when the row count grows, then you might run into some performance things. So having some perform, having a table around to do performance, that was the purpose of App Random. So we'll be using that. We'll build a listing and turn on the default search sort filtering so that we can see what it's, uh, what it will do well, what it's slow at, and then so maybe we'll see the performance issues and the complex filtering needs that can't be addressed by by our functionality. So let's let's do that. Um, let's introduce app random here. I have an entity called app random, and uh, if I we can we can just open it up using the uh, default functionality that uh, that app builder builds for us. And it has data like uh, you know, all, all all of our entities have an ID, but um, I have a lot of data here. I happen to choose um, temperatures, Fahrenheit between. Uh, I think 95 and 100 and something, we'll see. Um, and then uh, they have some field alerts. We have names at random. We have certain, uh, some dates at random. And uh, 
So this is our date, data. But notice we have <clears throat> 800,300 records. So, uh, I mean, it's not as huge as you might get, but it's bigger than the 100. So it'll give us something to, to shoot at. So that's, uh, that's our data. And um, that's what's behind the scenes. Here's my empty page, and I'm going to put it into edit mode, and we'll just build this from scratch. Edit mode, and I am going to choose we, we uh, it's action grid. Our listing module is called action grid, and we can drop it onto the page, and we'll begin to configure it. It's still telling us it's not configured, so we'll open it up. First step of this is to um, connect it to some data. And uh, I am going to start by using, uh, we're going to do a, a SQL or a SQL advanced, SQL select or SQL advanced. Um, we're going to start out with SQL select. And I'll just mention here as we're going along, you're talking about performance. If you can use a SQL select to do the work, uh, this behind the scenes takes advantage of something called common table expression CTEs uh, that adds some performance. So if you can use SQL select and you're trying to choose between these two, they look the same, but SQL select is a little more performant. If you have um, some more things that you're trying to do, some complex SQL that doesn't fit into SQL select, and we'll actually have some of that here before we get done. Uh, you might need to switch it to SQL Advanced. It uh, looks the same, but it's a little slower. So we'll start with SQL Select. So um, the SQL that we're going to do is we're going to just select everything from our table app. And the, we're just going to configure it the minimum way. We need to have an ID column or one unique column so that um, our action grid, our listing product knows which one is uh, what What makes that row unique. So that's the ID column. We hit save. I'm going to add some fields. Uh, I'm not going to add all of them. We'll have the ID. Um, I want the random number. I'm going to ignore these alerts for now. But we'll have the name and the observed on date. So fifth, uh, we'll have four columns in our listing. And for all these, I want to turn on, I, I'm going to make the observed on filterable, just so we can see the functionality that we get. But they're sortable, searchable. And in the same way, there's a limited number of names here that's going to work out. So sortable, filterable, searchable. The random number, these are all over the place. So filtering them doesn't make sense. But we'll leave them sortable and searchable so that we can get into them. And then we don't particularly, we're not going to focus on ID today. So we'll save that, take a look at what we get. Our listing is generating um, those four columns. If we want to search, we can look for a name. Notice that it takes a little while to run through because it's got these 800,000 records. But once we pick one, now it goes to 80,000 records. I have 10 different names in here. They're all divided evenly, so that's why it worked out that way. Um, the observed on, when we click into this, we can see it running a little bit to go and figure out what dates are available there. And so if we wanted to pick um, data that was observed on a particular date, we could check that. We could check that. So we're getting two different dates now. Um, 10 4 and 10 5. And so if, if uh, this this might be good enough for what you want to do, you can filter by a person, you can filter by when when it was observed. Uh, we did a search. Uh, the search might also let you pick. Now I'm clearing it. Notice it takes a little while to, to refresh. Um, in our search, maybe we want to search for a temperature like uh, 101.5, and that takes a while to load. By the way, when we're talking about this, uh, if you have big data, there on, on uh, some of our older versions, doing this search might run into trouble where the, the search, uh, as you're changing this value, it, the search doesn't get into what doesn't finish with um, the correct 
things selected. Later versions of 125, we fixed this. So if you run it, if that applies to you, you can look for that later hotfix. Anyway, so I said 101.5, and I'm getting all these 101.5 things, and that's good. So now let's illustrate the problem. We we've already seen performance. It's it's a little bit slow coming in here, um, but also if we want to, uh, we can get everything you know that's 101. But if we wanted 102 also, um, that's going to, uh, we're not going to be able to express that by way of a search. Uh, and it's, I think we're going to get, um, and, and if what we really wanted to do was, was between 101.5 and 102.5, there's really no way to express that in the search, in the search uh, box. Another area where we could run into problems, uh, trying to sort this to see what we did get out of this search that I did. Um, see, we didn't get any 102, we didn't actually get any 102 records, uh, or if we had searched for those individually, uh, we would have. Um, and then another one would be like, if you date range, you might want to have, um, days uh, things from last quarter and so how do you express that you want things from last quarter it would be between this date and that date and um, so it, it the filtering doesn't let you get there so a more complex word clause would be required um interesting oh i've got a space in there i was just wondering what it was, what it was doing there so this defines the problem, speed and uh, connection. Okay. Oh. 102 is, oh, here it is, the ID is searchable. And so we're seeing 102s popping up in the ID. So again, this is another reason if your data, uh, your, so if we have search enabled for all fields, maybe it's not the, the field. It's looking at fields that you don't want it to look at. So here we go. That defines the problem. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start out by con uh, configuring our listing to filter by way of a where clause. We're going to add a where clause and link it to the query string. And uh, that's going to let us do the, the, the thing. We'll demonstrate that it works. That's our first step in linking this to a form. So I'm going to open this uh, grid in a new tab so that we can get to it quickly and go back and forth. And then the first thing I'm going to do, those of you who know me, I've got to name this. So this is our random data listing. It's going to call it random data, just to give it a nice name. And um, I am going to close out of edit mode just so that we can see. So now it says, you know, random data. And I wanted to illustrate this thing here, this page builder. Notice that it has an icon here that is uh, not just a gear icon. So this is an enhancement, that hotfix I was talking about. And uh, you can also right click and open that in a new tab and get to the editing mode where we're managing the grid. So, um, Nice, nice enhancement there for, for that. Okay, so the place that we're going is in our data source, instead of asking for everything, we are going to ask only for some things. And I've got my ideas here on another screen, so I'm gonna take a look at that. The first thing that we're going to do is maybe we wanna filter it by name. So we could add a where clause and say uh, that the name is like target name. And if you're not familiar with it, this is a, a, uh, a binding. And so you, we're gonna bind target name to something. Well, the something that we're gonna bind it to is uh, our query string, the get will get something off the query string. We're going to get a variable called target name off the query string, and uh, it will search for that. 
And because I'm using a like, I can use wild cards. This is uh, just a preference of mine. But the percent sign says it could begin with anything, but it has to have uh, whatever our target name is, and then it could end with anything. So that's the syntax that I'm using. With that simple change saved, we can go back to our listing and we'll refresh. Now, if I were to go up here, this is the prove it works thing. We can pick a name and if it's working correctly, it will do that. So now we only have Linda's records and we are count is down to eight, 80,000 instead of 800,000. Uh, and so already we're more performant because when we try and search something, um, we're now only searching 80,000 records instead of 800,000 records. And so these filtering and searching capabilities are going to be improved already. And if we want them only for a particular date, we can do that. And uh, so now it's already a little bit better. Um, but, but wait, there's more. Instead of just doing just the name, let's say that we also want to be able to filter uh, on a number. The, the random number here, we want to have a high and a low. So we could add uh, something like an random number is greater than or equal to, and then we'll say min random number, oh, min random, and we'll say also and uh, is less than or equal to so we've introduced two more variables, and this is going to let us pick a nice range. So uh, we'll create some bind tokens here for min random and max random, and then get their values again from the query string. So we'll say get min random and get max random. Now, one of the things, uh, we'll go ahead, let's go ahead and run into the error. <clears throat> one of the things that, that uh, is a problem is that these, these values are blank. Um, we don't, on our, it doesn't current, currently exist on our query string. We hit save, we get this horrible looking error message that uh, says there's a problem converting something uh, variable to numeric. <clears throat> The error message isn't friendly, but the problem is easy. Min random is blank. It's not able to convert it to a um, integer value or a, a numeric value. Instead, um, our token mechanism lets you provide values. So let's say that we uh, equals zero says that the fault, if it's not provided, is equal to zero. And um, we'll provide a default for this one equals 999. So even if they're not provided, they're now going to have values and not blow up the SQL. I'll remind you, please uh, add any questions along the way. If I skip something or if you're curious, Patrick will call them to my attention. So back to our uh, listing, we can now um, use those in the same way. We can say that the min random is 98.6, is 7.5, and if it's doing what we expect, we're only going to see Linda's records and in this uh, smaller temperature range. Ah, I got it backwards. It's doing exactly what I asked and not what makes sense. So we want it between 98 and 99. So uh, now if we sort by random number, we can see that it um, starts at the 98.6 area. If we sort it backwards, we can see the highest one is 99.5, doing exactly what we asked. And we're dealing with 6,000 records, 7,000 records instead of 800,000. Um, we can take out name Linda and get, get them for 
everybody, but these min random and max random are still going to apply. So, uh, so there's that. Um, and then the last bit of functionality we mentioned, maybe we want to do uh, dates by a particular range. And uh, the filtering is going to let us do particular dates, but we got to click them one by one. And so let's let's say that we want to do them by range. So we'll come back here, modify our data source one more time. Um, this one is going to be something like this. We'll say and the observed on can be greater than or equal to something, and that something I'm going to use a SQL function. So this says that this is doing a little bit of date math, and it says that we're going to add zero days or minus seven days to whatever the current date is. And, and so this is going to let us express a date um, relative to today. But what we want to do is uh, we want it, to, again, to be on the query string. And so now I'm going to do, do some copy and paste. It's the same idea, but I, I've got it. The answer already done. And so we're going to say the date is greater than or equal to some, uh, whoops, this is jumping ahead. We're going to get it off the query string. We're going to get something called days ago oldest, days ago recent. We're defaulting them to values. And in, in the oldest one, we're saying 999 days ago, most recent one, one day ago. And uh, so this, this is going to give us, by default, it's going to give us a full range, but we can override by providing it on the query stream. Now, this is one of those errors, again, we're going to, I'm going to save and we're going to see another error and saying uh, invalid column name, get days ago, blah, 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 can't do it. Um, and so the reason for this is that this syntax uh, requires us to pass in an integer value and um, even passing it in through a bind token wouldn't work the way we expect it to. So I'm just going to skip ahead to the answer. And that answer is that instead of doing that, we'll use SQL advanced. So when we switch to SQL advanced, um, this syntax being able to put a token directly into your uh, SQL is acceptable. I'll point out this is potentially a security risk. Uh, if if somebody if somebody has control over this, um, it's there's a whole topic of SQL injection, so you should pay attention to that. But for this demonstration, it's going to be just fine. So we'll save that. We no longer get the error, but now we'll be able to do uh, filtering by observed on. So we can now say, um, for example. Uh, let's see, that's the wrong thing. Uh, days ago oldest, and we'll say that that's equal to um, 60. And so the filtering on this should now change so that, um, there we go. I didn't, got a spell, right? Patrick, you're supposed to stop. <laughs> I, I thought maybe, but I wasn't wasn't sure I was removing it right. So now we're seeing it's filtering based on that, and we could do the same thing with uh, days ago recent. Let's say equals sixty. So now it's. Um, it's like thirty. So now it's between sixty and thirty days back and so we get different results anyway so this is all this has been set up right now we have uh, we can use this query string to manipulate our form to do exactly what we want i'm going to save this aside for a second just so in case we need to use it but we'll refresh our our core form no parameters and we get the, the 800,000 records here after a while 800,300 so now we're finally in a spot where this is 
able to be wired to a, uh, um, a, for, a filtering form. So it's there, it works, here we go. That's good. <clears throat> oh, I went backwards. So the next thing we're gonna do is build a form that uh, uses this query string. We're gonna create the form, we'll collect some filters and uh, add a button to do that. And, and it's just gonna change the query string for us. So this is kind of a wall, walk, crawl, walk, run scenario. We're starting off slow, but, but we're gonna do lots more. So here we go, we'll put it back into edit mode and put a form on our page. I'm going to drop the form above the listing, just visually. The filtering form will be on top. The listing will be on the bottom. We'll go in and manage this. First time we have to say we want a blank form. Call this my filtering form. I happen to like my labels on the top, so I'm going to do that. And then here we go. We'll add a text field, text box, actually. And this is going to be the target name. Type in which one we want to filter it to. Uh, and it's going to have this name then of target name. So I'm going to copy that because I'm going to use it below. And I'm I'm not going to go very far with this right now. I'm just going to do name first. Visually, I'm going to narrow that column down so it doesn't take up the whole screen. But uh, we'll add a button that's going to be called uh, filter. Let's call it apply filter. And when they click the button, what we want to do is we're just going to uh, redirect them to this page, which is the so redirect to portal page action is what we're going to do. Say that we want, we don't have to actually pick a page. We want to come back to the same page. But from a query sting perspective, we want to do an target, uh, target name is the value we want to pass. And we want to say equal to and target name from our form. So query string is going to have target name added to it. Um, I happen to not like, you can you leave this either way, but I like to have, leave it unchecked. Um, but uh, that's all we need to do. So this is gathering a piece of information, <laughs> target name up above. They have a button. When they click the button, it's just going to reopen this page going to target name. So we'll save that and go back to our visual. See how slowly it loads. But now we have this field, this button. So now we can, if we say, will you apply a filter, we'll see that the page redirects and just going to take care, to, uh, take advantage of this query string that we were, we've already demonstrated. So already works. So it comes to the page, it filters by William. Good deal. Well, so that's one way to do it. Um, and we could put our other filters in, and over time, time we might do those as well uh, to to be able to filter them along uh, any of those. Um, But in the interest of getting some other things done too, um, let's see. We've demonstrated that that this works. We've created a form, we've collected some filters, and we've used the query string. So the problem is, or not necessarily a problem, but um, I actually want to do this. Uh, we we can we can do this better, right? Um, it's causing the whole page to load again in order to apply this filter. And we don't have to do that. So uh, instead we can, um, we can use a different action instead of a redirect causing the page to load, we can 
use a filtering action. Um, let's do that. We'll open this up. And actually, it's here in Page Builder now. This, you can see, form has a different icon than listing. And so we can open this in a new tab. Um, so on our action, instead of redirecting, we'll do something else. Uh, we're going to delete this one out. And instead, if you search, there's a uh, filter, filter listing action that we can take advantage of. And so this refreshes a listing without a page reload. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We have to tell it which listing we want to redo. And then we want to pass information. Uh, there's different ways to pass information, but we're passing by the query string. And so we're just going to say add data and we're going to pass target name. And the value of target name is going to be from our form. So this uh, gets us there. We want to prevent a page refresh. So there's a update form Ajax. This just says that uh, it's going to refresh the listing, but then not refresh the page. And we'll save that. There's one more thing we have to do. Our, our data listing um, needs to be watching to see that the URL changed. So in the settings, there's a setting called sync with URL. We just click and click that on and save it. So that way when our filtering form passes in this information uh, and, and changes the URL, it will um, it will be watching for that change. So I can say Linda and apply filter. We should see it appear up here. Uh, and the, but the whole page shouldn't refresh. So it happens, and it switches over to Linda. And if I do it again, which is over to Robert very quickly, filtering is down to the 80,000 instead of 800,000. So that's another way to do it. And um, yeah, so that might be as much as you need to know to be able to do uh, to do filter by form. That we're we, we create the form, collect the filters, and you uh, pass them by way of the query string. One of those two ways. <clears throat> There's a uh, you may not want to pass things by the query string for a couple of reasons. Sometimes you don't want to want to reveal, for example. Um, you might not want your users to be able to uh, know that they can manipulate this by uh, typing uh, up into the URL. Um, or you might just like a nice clean URL with nothing at the end of it. So we can make some quick changes to this that will make this work uh, without that. So uh, the quick changes that we're going to do in our... Um, and I'm, I'm going to jump people over here into tokens and show you there's a feature within our core tokens called session. And a session token lets us, uh, there's an ability to set session. So uh, a, ver a session variable is just a behind the scenes variable connected to that one particular user. Um, and so we'll be able to set session and then we'll be able to uh, display session. And I'm, I'm actually going to use a variant called uh, get or session, which is kind of nice because it lets us do it both ways. You can do it on the query string or use the behind the scenes. But uh, in our data, we'll do, um, instead of using get all over the place, we'll say get or session. And I'm going to copy this everywhere we're doing this. And down here to our bind parameters as well. So this is going to work the same way. It'll still get things off the query string. But if we pass things by way of, of a session variable, uh, they'll, it'll work as well. So first, a quick test. Um, form still loads, no errors. Listing still loads, no errors. 
but we'll change our filtering form now that instead of passing it uh, by way of filter listing and passing it on the query string this way, we'll, um, I'm just going to delete this out. We're not going to use that at all. And instead, we'll um, set a session variable. So these, these can be set by way of create or update tokens. I'm going to do this up for my Ajax, but um, the uh, token that we want to set, we're actually not, uh, we want to evaluate a token, but it, we're not, we're not going to create a new token. So I don't care what this one is called. It has to be called something. I'm calling it dummy, but we're going to use the set session variable. And I'm going to copy and paste to get the syntax of this. Um, but we go into our filtering form and we have something like this. So I'm going to set session target name. Uh, so this behind the scenes variable is going to be called target name. And the value that we're going to set in it is the one off the form called things oftentimes the exact same thing. So this is off the form, setting it here. So now it's set, and now we have to tell the form to do something with it. So we can add a, there's a refresh listing action. Again, we'll put it, position it uh, after the, the session variable is created. The listing that we want to refresh is the random data listing. So this sets a variable behind the scenes. This causes the uh, listing to be refreshed. And if we look at our, remember our data source, this is um, saying it can retrieve the target name from either the query string, the get part, or from the session. Uh, and so we were gonna, it's gonna be consuming it that way. Anyway, here we go. So if I go and do John and apply the filter, it still isn't going to change pages because that Ajax is going to take that to happen. But um, it's also not going to change the query string anymore because uh, we just passed it in a variable behind the scenes and it's being consumed here. So I just mentioned one thing about this one is that get or session has a special property that says uh, now that's that session is set to uh, that session variable is set to John. If we navigate away from this page and come back, or uh, just you've seen me clicking here to do that, it's it's set to John. So um, it's doing what we ask. It's going to stay that way. That might be something that you want it to do once they make once your user makes a selection. You want it to stay with them. If you don't want that to happen, you might uh, have an event in our, uh, I'm going to copy this create update token, uh, and we'll, we'll do something similar to that in our uh, on page load, for example, we'll um, clear all these. So I'm going to do that same action, but instead of setting it to the target name, set it to blank. So this is initializing the session variable every time the page loads uh, so that it, that behavior that I was just showing doesn't happen. So now uh, reload the page and it's not going to filter on John anymore because that gets cleared out before it gets applied. Um, but we can still use it as so long as we stay on the page and don't refresh the page, it'll still filter. So just something to be aware of. Okay. So this was, yeah, we can use query uh, session variables. That's another thing. So another thing that we were hoping to get to is to see this maybe done in, in a different way in a tab. We don't, we don't haven't demonstrated tabs very much recently. So, Let's say that uh, we want all of our filtering stuff to happen on one tab and the data to appear on another tab. Pretty easy to do, just a couple of configuration changes and uh, we'll be there. So 
one of them is that we'll need to add a tab control. And, uh, oh, we call, it's called ABT Tabs Pro is the type of control that we're doing. I'm going to just drop it right up here on the top. And um, let's see. This is the form. We don't need that. Uh, here's our tab. And so, and actually here I've been struggling, but it's right down here. I can see that's a third type of icon there. So uh, we'll open the tabs pro and configure it. We're gonna have two tabs. One is gonna be called filter. And we're going to put our filtering form on that tab. And then the other one is going to be called view data or something like that. And we'll put our random data listing on that. Um, so now when we save and refresh, a second to load up here, but um, we have our filter showing here and our data showing here. And this mostly works, but um, the ideal would be that if you typed in name and apply filter, that not only would it apply your filter, but it would also switch over to view data so that, uh, that you have it and we can do that. Patrick, did you have something? No, I'm sorry. Did I make a noise? <laughs> I, I I thought I, I thought you were trying to gently butt in and help me uh, fix something. So uh, this filtering form that we already have, we have our apply filter button, and um, it's it's all working. We're passing it by session. We're refreshing the listing. We just need to switch to a different page now. Uh, the easiest way I found to, to know what to do next, notice we're on the filter tab, we have a hashtag filter 536. If I click on view data, it switch over, it changes to hashtag view data 537. This key is what we need in order to, um, ch uh, to jump to this page. Uh, we just need to, to redirect to this page. So I'll show you how to do that. Uh, we will be adding a, a redirect to URL. And again, I'm going to position it. It needs to be above this Ajax. We're actually not going to need the Ajax anymore. But the URL that we're going to want to jump to is question mark, represents the same page, and then our view tab. So clicking the button will automatically move it to the view tab. Uh, stays on the same page, and that's it. Um, so now we can, and I'm going to get out of edit mode here so we can see this a little bit cleaner. So if you like, if you wanted a tab view where the filters are on one page and the data is on another, uh, this gets you there. So we have our filter, and we can go to Robert, click the button, that switches to the view data tab. We're going to see Robert's data. Huh. Well, in theory, we're going to see Robert's data. Uh, what have I done wrong? Maybe I hadn't refreshed it. No, I had, so amazing. These things work in uh, <laughs> uh 
oh, I know. Page is, in fact, refreshing this um, this thing that I added. In my filtering form events is taking place. This thing mm -hmm. clearing us out. So I'm I'm gonna delete that out for convenience purposes here. And <clears throat> but now when it jumps to this, it uh, will not. Is there a, a reason that you did the, um, the uh, redirect instead of the change tab, or are you getting to the change tab? Was it just uh, showing different ways of doing things? Well, I'd like to say it was the change tab, but uh, I think is, is there a there might be a hole in my knowledge is there a change tab action yeah mm -hmm. All right, let's let's do that this is exciting <laughs> change tab and stop execution this is exactly what we want so we want to pick our tabs pro see i should have named it better i haven't named it yet but we want to go to filter data to view data rather and so instead of redirect to url we'll not do that we don't need this Ajax anymore. So this is going to uh, be the only thing that's there. It's going to change tab. And we don't need to change anything else. So that's a thanks for, thanks for playing along, Patrick. Yeah. So that's probably going to be more efficient anyway, because it's not going to cause everything to fully reload. Let's say, John. Filter. Yeah. And there's some trickery you can do also that I would need to look up that would make the John, you know, make it so you you don't see Robert first when you switch over here. But yeah. Good. All right. Um, in our last three minutes, just to demonstrate uh, other things that you can do with this. Um, I wanted to point out that, I mean, we did this as a in a tab, which worked really well, but we can also do this in a pop-up, and that's a kind of a fun, another presentation that's easy to demonstrate. So we're going to have to undo our tab stuff and then convert that to a pop-up form and open it. Um, so let's get that done. Um, first of all, we'll delete our tab. If you liked it, the, the tab view, you don't have to do any of this. Um, but here's our tab. I delete it off the page. Once it doesn't exist anymore, uh, the, the filter, we have our form, filtering form and our random data just as before. In our form, we need to make a couple of changes. We're going to turn this into a pop-up form. So in our, in our display mode, we'll say that we want it to be in pop-up. And I like to make things, uh, I don't like these defaults, so I like to make it 85% wide when it opens in pop-up. Um, our button needs to be a little bit different. So we no longer need to uh, change the tab. Um, so we can just delete that. So we're still setting our, our session token. We're still reflect, refreshing the listing, but that's all there is there. So with those couple of changes, we get close. We're not there, but we get close. The uh, and, and we'll need to eliminate this, but we can see that the form is still there. Uh, but it's uh, it's not opening. Let's see. We were actually will want to change that uh, instead of in pop up. We can change it to uh, manual, so it'll only happen when we uh, execute that. Um, and so now it's completely invisible to the page. It will be. And the other thing that we need to do now then is to add a button up here someplace that says I want to filter this. So we'll go to our uh, listing and add a root button that says filter. 
filters, let's say, and we'll show that at the top right as a um, call it primary button. And the action that we wanted to do is um, search for pop up. We want to open form pop up and stop execution. The form that we want to open is our filtering form. Uh, we're going to let the user uh, close this any way they want to, and uh, that should do it. So now when we refresh, we should have a filters button. Click it, we say that we want Linda, apply a filter. Thought it would refresh for us at the close. Ah, probably should, I should have had an Ajax on the end of that. Notice we had a page refresh. Let's add an Ajax. It's going to be yes on our filtering form. This Ajax is going to keep it from refreshing, so get a little bit better of an impact. So we'll do our filters again. Or I, um, you probably ultimately will want to do a close form pop up and a and stop execution. That would keep you from having a refresh page as well. Yes, that would be a better answer. Yeah, because we got it, but now it didn't. Yeah. It, it's happening in the background, so your your uh, answer is correct. Clean that up too. Stop. Ajax, and we're closing our filtering form. So a little bit of play in here to make this work. So it doesn't and work. Yes, sir. It I, I was going to say that, you know, there's the reinitialize form um, checkbox for when you're opening it. But I think in this case, is a, I almost always check that. But in this case, I think it's a good use case for not checking the reinitialize form so that when you open up, you have your current search there automatically. Right. All right. So um, I think we've hit what we were aiming at, um, that we covered all the different ways you can use it, the filtering form why you might want to. And then the things that you might do to improve this would be that um, you could improve the form to do things like have presets. So maybe you get a, get your filtering all set up the way that you wanted to, and then you could hit save. And those all those filtering selections go into a entity that you could then recall from. So that's one uh, cool one that I've done in the past. <clears throat> or allow them to be saved as a user preference so that every time user A goes to the form, it's set up just the way they like it. But when user B goes, they have a completely different setup. So those are another simple enhancements that if you uh, do any work with forms or watch our video about forms, you can figure out how to do. Since there were no, yo, Patrick, do you have anything else that you can add before we bring it in? Um, no, I don't think so. Great. So with that, happy low coding. I hope you're able to add filtering forms to your listings in the right conditions. Uh, give us some feedback on this. Come drop in on uh, Low Code Cafe, Low Code Campfire on Friday, and we can talk about it some more. Until then, we'll see you guys again for another Low Code Cafe in two weeks.